have a problem session starting at 10.15 uh, in the and continue and then we'll be afterwards as we discuss. Uh, right. So, uh, last time um, we were discussing Uh, right, so we were discussing some of the really foundational understanding of wave, wave mechanics. Uh, how we think about the wave function. So, uh, fundamentally, the main uh, interpretation of the wave function, of course, is the wave function related to probability amplitudes. And the square of the wave function uh, at a particular point telling us about the probability density to find the particle at a particular point in space and, or in, uh, as a density, obviously, uh, at some given time. And that probability density in, in a mechanical system will generally flow. And that flow equation, that kind of equivalent of fluid, Flow that we think about uh, is described by the continuity equation. So the continuity equation is familiar mostly to, to most of you, I'm sure, in the context of um, electricity and magnetism, where rho is the charge density and J is the current density uh, of charge, but it's a general statement of flow of fluid, whatever that fluid might be. And the uh, physical meaning of the continuity equation, of course, is conservation of whatever stuff is flowing. In this case, it's thought about as the conservation of probability. Which really is to say that uh, what we're saying in this situation is that um, in a system where we're described by a potential, where the potential is a real function, the particle is neither created nor destroyed, it just moves. And that movement is described by the flow of the probability density, and that is described by the probability current, which written in this form, we see as whatever the local density is times a uh, sort of effective velocity of flow. And that effective velocity of flow is determined by the gradient of the local wave front to the system. So we think about the probability flowing along rays, which are the normals to the wave fronts. Okay. All right. So, uh, moreover, what we, of course, one of the foundational ideas which laid at the heart of the whole development of the quantum theory was the understanding of wave particle duality. I mean, wave particle duality is where the whole idea of the probability amplitude arose and all of the craziness that we've been talking about relative to quantum mechanics came from trying to understand the nature of the world and the, you know, the foundations of physics, Newton, come from really two things, mechanics and optics. And trying to understand uh, the nature of the motion of the heavenly bodies and the, and the, and the, uh, the nature of light is really the foundation of physics. And there were sort of, of course, within that, particularly in optics, there were the competing theories of optics <coughs> the particle theory, 
the corpuscular theory, as Newton uh, called it, and the wave theory, which was Huygens' uh, idea of how what the nature of light was. Okay, and so in the sort of particle picture, we have uh, the idea of a ray of light that moves along a particular trajectory. Okay, that was Newton thought as principle that light was made up of tiny little particles that were streaming at super high speeds and were and there were forces exhibited or exerted apart upon them by material which caused them to reflect, refract, and reflect. Um, in modern theory, we know that the ray theory of light is a limit of the wave theory of light in the short wavelength approximation. And the description of rays is unified with the description of the motion of particles and the mechanics of Lagrange and Hamilton. So I've kind of, it's not a very nicely written chart, I'm try to write this out in my notes more clearly, uh, of the complete analogies between these things. So in the ray theory, we have we could, the equation of motion of the rays follows at, from an action principle. That is stationary. The, the, the trajectories of the rays are the stationary so, the functions, I mean, the, the solutions which make the action stationary under perturbations around those trajectories. And that's codified in Fermat's principle. Fermat said in the 17th century that we can understand the trajectory of a light ray in a, in a medium in terms of minimizing the time it took for the light to get from one point to another. But in modern parlance, what's that saying is that there's an optical pathway, and we're minimizing the optical path length. And the optical path length is determined by, determined by the local index of refraction. Um, and the solution to this is a basically the Euler-Lagrange equation that we know from this side, where the, the motion of the particle in a potential is determined by the stationary action and the trajectories which minimize the action where the action is, is unchanged with small perturbations around those trajectories are the Euler-Lagrange equations, which is Newton's law, F equals MA. So uh, that's the particle picture. Competing with that is the wave picture. In the wave picture, uh, um, we have a wave equation. The equation of the wave, say, for the electric field moving, which has some frequency omega moving in this uh, index of refraction, this energy reducing this refraction, is this. And the Huygens principle basically says that the rays are the normals to those wave fronts. And uh, if we have the iconal approximation, which is to say when the wavelength is small compared to whatever the length scale for change of the, say, the index, then uh, the, we have a solution which is the, the same as this. Okay. And the iconal approximation, so the, under the iconal approximation, the 
we have a wave, this is the wave solution, whose rays follow Fermat's principle. Okay? This is an approximation. under that case. Now, on this side of the equation, there's kind of an interesting history. So this equation, which I have no room in my horrible planning, this is the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So the Hamilton-Jacobi equation is follows from classical mechanics. It's not a wave theory. It's a mechanical theory. But what we have seen is that this equation follows as the geometrical optical approximation to the Schroeder equation. In which case, we understand that classical dynamics of a particle the trajectory that a particle follows in the classical limit is the limit where the wavelength of the De Bruyne wavelength of the particle is sufficiently small compared to the, the um, length scale over which the forces change, which would cause diffraction of those waves. And when we don't have such diffraction, then we have rays. And those rays follow the classical trajectories. That also gives us a way of writing down a solution to the Schroeder equation when uh, we're in this approximation. And that is uh, known as the WKB approximation, where the we basically use the Huygens wavefront associated with the surfaces such that the rays of those wavefronts are the classical trajectories. So when the wavelength, the De Bruyne wavelength of the particle is sufficiently short compared to the length scales over which the potential is changing, we can write down an approximate solution immediately. In fact, the amplitude here is uh, related to 1 over that. We wrote down that solution last time. Okay. So of course, all of these things are unified together. There's one, in some sense, what we see is there's one, these two equations are the same. And the unification of them is the way particles are happening. So in wave particle duality, particles with certain energy have certain frequencies, and particles with certain momenta have certain wave numbers or wavelengths. And obviously from freshman physics. And uh, what we see here is that the uh, Unification between the wave and the particle theory is to say that we can have our general action principle here, which is, again, always minimizing this optical path length. But these are, in fact, the same thing. That this action from the point of view of At Hamilton. This is the same thing as the Lagrangian here, inside here. Right? This is the Lagrangian dt, which is this. And uh, for a constant energy, this was p dx minus b times the time difference. And with this relationship here, this is equal to. Uh, k as a function of x, the x. Yeah. 
that's a times h bar. Minus. So it's the same, this action principle is the same as this action principle, because what is k? k as a function of x is omega over c times n of x in optics. Or what we have over here, it's the momentum uh, as a function of x over h bar, which is equal in mechanics to the square root of twice the total energy minus the potential energy. Right? That's what this that's what's going in here. So we have exactly the same uh, unified theory. There are waves. There are rays, which are limits with short wavelengths, and they undergo they have this exactly the same uh, action principle where the effective index of refraction in mechanics is given here. Okay. So notice that though that there is this kind of weird relationship, a bigger potential here corresponds to a smaller index here. Notice in particular, if I look at the phase velocity, If I look at what that is locally at some position of space in this in this gray picture, of course, if I write in the wave particle duality, this is this, which is a, a curious thing. What it's saying is that the velocity of these wave fronts that move in order to ensure that the normals to those wave fronts are the classical trajectories move inversely with the speed of the classical particle. Which is why Newton got it wrong. Newton said that inside a material, light moves faster. It's the only way you could get refraction to work. Now, no one could measure the speed of light at Newton's time. Uh, so maybe Newton was right. Uh, but um, Huygens' principle kind of took over. And once they measured the speed of light, they saw, in fact, the speed of light moved slower, then that doomed the particle theory. The particle theory of light was thermatic. It was totally bogus uh, theory. Well, it's hard for them to measure between C and half C. Because they couldn't measure anything. That's fast at that time. So it, that's an interesting fact. However, it is quite curious that Hamilton Jacobi equation is, I mean, and Hamilton knew this, that, that he could understand the trajectories of classical particles as the rays of a wave front. We didn't call them wave fronts, but these surfaces that were moving. But interestingly, well, not interestingly, there's no way that he could have guessed that, in fact, the classical mechanics was the ray optics limit of a more fundamental wave theory. But it is, and it's all together. Now, so. So you, this unification is pretty clear. It, there's, of course, many subtleties to this. Should we think about the electric field as the wave function of the photon? Kind of. The, the subtlety, the problem is that the photon is a relativistic particle. It's as relativistic as they get. 
and relativistic quantum mechanics is, has some differences with respect to the uh, non-relativistic mechanics. The notion of localizing particles, and rel you can't do that because particle number isn't conserved. And what it means for it to measure the position of a particle relativistically is a much more subtle question. As I said, position is demoted, it's no longer an observable in quantum field theory. But nonetheless, these analogies should be kept. Uh, final thing, of course, we talked about a little bit at the end of, of lecture last time, the idea of the path integral. And I, I would encourage you to, to read about that some of yourself. There's a, there's a nice sort of beginning description of it in Sakurai's text. And I, I, Sakurai's text is quite good. I recommend trying to get a, a hold of it if you don't have it. Uh, but. Um, we can understand the quantum mechanics in saying that instead of having a single positive trajectory quantumly, in some sense, the system explores all possible trajectories. And they're weighted by a probability amplitude uh, that's given by lo local action of that trajectory. And that principle that connects classical dynamics and classical action quantum dynamics is a foundation of quantum mechanics. And we use it all the time, particularly in quantum field theory and in um, statistical physics as well. So I would encourage you to take a peek at that. Okie dokie. All right, so now let's get into some nitty gritty. So given this, we're just going to go at lightning speed today, talking about rate mechanics and what something you've studied over and over again, part of the box, all that stuff. I just want to get some of this. Uh, some of the foundations down. All right. So we have some potential as a function of x. Right. Let's say it looks like this. And what we call the zero tetra energy is irrelevant. So specifying the energy and the initial condition completely specifies the trajectory, classically, right? That's, you know, the standard trick to do. You want to throw up a, a ball, how high will it go? You could just use conservation of energy to do it. So, for example, if a particle started at some position, if, this was, if its energy was this and it started at some position, it will oscillate between these two points, or turning points. Because, of course, the total, the kinetic energy must always be bigger, not, it has to always be bigger than or equal to the potential for all x. It's a positive number. Uh, Alrighty. So, uh, um, this is one kind of solution. If we started up here, 
then I have this one turning point. Right? So this is another possible trajectory. I can come in here, bounce off, and come back. If I started over here at this energy, I'll hit this guy and bounce back. If I started over here at the same energy, then, of course, I'll hit this turning point and bounce back. Can, can through the this is classical. So now let's, of course, talk about the quantum mechanics. So classically, we have this uh, supposed to be at the same energy. Um, so this, of course, in this case, this kind of solution uh, we call a scattering. So a particle will scatter off this potential. This is also scattering. This is bound motion. This is the bounce motion of the particle. Now, of course, you know, and as Steve alluded to, if I look at this, so I look at my, my Schrodinger equation in 1D. This is the equation that we just, the time independent Schrodinger equation has this form. So that means the local solution, if I think WK be like. That'd be K squared if apply K kappa squared. No, it, K squared is minus kappa. Because K squared can be negative. So the WKB solution, which gives us a hint of things, will be of the form e to the minus kappa. kind of exponential tails. Of course, what that means is that what was classically forbidden, this is this region, uh, the particle, if it had this energy, it cannot be in this region. It's not classically forbidden. Now it's classically allowed. It means, of course, we can tunnel. And uh, so we have tunneling, classically. I mean, quantum. Moreover, um, these two solutions now can, be, in some sense, become mixed. So what that means is that when I have this kind of situation, 
I can have what I I can have a scattering resonance, as we will study next semester. If you come in with a certain energy, which is resonant with a quasi downstate, then there is a particular kind of scattering that occurs due to the fact that the particle can tunnel in and rattle around at a resonant energy and then tunnel back out. It gives a much stronger kind of scattering interaction. Moreover, if I started the system here, classically, whereas it, whereas it would be bound, quantumly, it has a finite lifetime. And it's only quasi-bound. And it can ultimately tunnel out. And, uh, that means, in some sense, that the particle inside this potential has a finite lifetime. All right. All right. So, uh, what can we say in general? century study of ODEs is known as Stern-Liebel theory. And there's, it's been well studied back then. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, you guys talk about it in 466? I don't know. Probably not. Uh, anyway, what can we say? Firstly, the solution satisfy the boundary conditions and because we don't want the solutions to blow up because we want to be able to look for normalizable solutions in here then we have discrete solutions discrete possible energetic Unbound states are trickier. Generally, uh, the unbound states, um, well, as we know, if you have a free particle, 
the energy eigenstates we can write down are plane waves. Plane waves are not normalizable. They are not in this set of square normalizable functions. Nonetheless, they form a basis of possible functions for this. And so we care about them for that reason, because we can always write a wave packet or a superposition of the unbound states, which is a physical state. Okay? But that means because we don't have this kind of boundary conditions to worry about here, then the what we all we don't want is so the unbound states is they should be normalizable like a delta function. So in other words, they don't blow up more than a delta function. The unbound states, though, don't have these boundary conditions, so we have a continuum.
kinetic energy. But any plane wave moving with that momentum, but with in a different direction, is also an ion state. Okay. What about the bound states? Well, the answer to that, as we will show in a moment, and you probably have seen before, the bound states means there cannot be degeneracy. No degeneracy. This is all about quantity. Of course, you know about higher dimensions, like hydrogen and so forth. We'll get to that in a little while. How do we see that? Again, here, brass sink. Let's say, for you give me in the same way as. Uh, Classically, you give me the energy, and that determines the trajectory. In quantum mechanics, you give me the energy, and that determines uh, the, um, the wave function, the bound state wave function. That's not true in higher dimensions, right? If I tell you the energy in, of, a, of a, a planet moving, around the sun, the energy alone is not enough to tell me to check. We also need to know the momentum, right? And the projection of that momentum as well. If I have those three numbers, then I can do the Kepler orbit. And the same thing is true. Quantum number. Those are the three quantum numbers. The principal quantum number, the L quantum number, the M. All right, how do we prove this? Uh, we have to remember how to do it because it's not going to be here. So, uh, let's say, consider two solutions. The same energy. Actually, I don't think I want to multiply by the star. I just want to multiply by that. Okay, so that means that d by dx of psi 2 d psi 1 dx minus psi 1 d psi 2 dx is 0. Which means that this which is the wrong scheme, is a constant. As a function of x. Okay. So, what that means then is that the derivative of psi 1 dx over psi 1 is equal to 
machine by Which means if you just integrate that, that psi 1 of x is proportional to psi 2 of x. If you integrate that, you get the log is equal to the log. And that means that 1 is just the uh, constant of times the other. And because you can always renormalize it, it means I skipped an important point because this doesn't follow. What is this constant? Because this says the constant is zero. And S is equal to this. Otherwise, the constant. For a bound state, it must be the case that at infinity, so if the domain extends to x goes to plus or minus infinity, the wave function has to go to zero for bound state. Right? Because otherwise it would be even the plus x and it would go up, and that's not a loud solution. So if that's the case, this goes to infinity, then the size goes to zero, which means the constant is zero. And then it follows. So that's why it's important as we're talking about bound states. Otherwise, this doesn't follow. So that means because of proportional normalization says that psi 1 must equal psi 2. So this is it's the same solution. So if we have the energy, we have the unique, there is a unique wave function for a bound state corresponding to that. That's the same thing that's true classically. Classically, given the energy, if it's a bound state, there's one trajectory. All right. Um, what else can we say general things about? So for bound state, I'm starting with this. First of all, you can prove the following thing. The lowest energy solution has no noise. That's what, of course, what we call the ground state.
Well, I mean, what we know is something about the relationship between kinetic energy and the derivative of the wave function, right? So the kinetic energy We see clearly from this that this is unitary. Because if I do it twice, it can be inverse of it. Yeah. 
What are the eigenvalues of a part? Well, as a unitary operator, but we see here under this definition, the parity operator is actually, its adjoint is actually equal to itself. Because the inverse operation is again the same operation. So this says that when you do it twice, you get the origin, I mean, you get the identity. So what are the eigenvalues of this operator? Plus or minus one. We know they have to be unit magnitude complex numbers. They're e to the i zero and e to the i pi. Because every unitary operator, its eigenvalues are phases. All right. Um, so, how does the parity operator act on an eigenket? Well, it turns the eigenket to the position uh, eigenket at minus x. Right. And so, we, so, if I look at the wave function, so I have a state psi, and uh, its wave function is of course, the position representation of the state. What is the position representation of the parity operator acting on psi? Well, if I look at the position representation of that vector, it's that. And this is the equivalent of the dagger of phi dagger, pi dagger acting on that. But this is equal to its own adjoint. So that is equal to minus x. So that's this evaluated minus. So the parity operator flips the state to what its value is on the mi at minus x. All right, so what can we say about this? Well, let's. Um, suppose we have a potential which is reflection symmetric. Well, written as an operator, that the Hamiltonian, if the potential is reflection symmetric, the kinetic energy is always reflection symmetric, therefore the Hamiltonian is invariant
under parity. That is to say, if I do this transformation, I get parity voting back. And what that means is that if I multiply uh, by um, pi on or pi on the left, yeah. Or equivalently, H commutes. So this is an important result. Uh, for reflection symmetric potentials, the Hamiltonian commutes with the parity operator. Okay. Now, if two operators commute, what can we say about their eigenvectors? That at least they can be the same. There, are, there exists common set of eigenvectors of both the Hamiltonian and the parity operator. Okay. But more as so this for first this is there exists common eigenstates of parity. And uh, however, we can say more because the only way they could be different is if there's degeneracy, right? Because when we can have degenerate degeneracies in the eigenvalues, then there can be different eigenfunctions that we can take superpositions of, which might be eigenvectors of one operator, but not the other. As we discussed with those block diagonal matrices and all that at the beginning of the semester. However, if we're talking about bound states, that extend to uh, infinity, then we say there's no degeneracies. <clears throat> Which means for these cases, energy eigenstates are eigenstates of parity. So that means that if I have a solution that is the nth bound state, that this solution is an eigenstate of parity, which means that this has to be plus or minus that which means in wave function language, if I multiply the cat here, that un of minus x, right, that's x on that, is plus or minus that. Which means that the solutions, the bound state solutions in one d are for as reflection symmetric potential are either symmetric or anti-symmetric. So basically it's an odd or even function? Correct. That's what I mean. Even or odd.
So let's look at some simple solutions. Of course, the solution we all know off the top of our head is the particle in a box. forbidden regions K0 is imaginary. In this region, the solutions are of the form either the plus or minus sine K0 X or sine and cosine And in this region, the solutions are e to the plus or minus kappa x or kosh and sinh. So depending upon the energy, you know, here in this region is classically forbidden, here it's classically allowed. All these regions are classically forbidden. This region is classically allowed. This region is classically forbidden. And so what you do, and you've done this, is you put these solutions in, and you match them at the boundary conditions with the condition that the wave function doesn't blow up. So here, the wave function has to grow like e to the plus kappa 1x. And here, it grows like e to the minus kappa I would call this e. And then inside here, I have the sines and cosines. And you have to match that the wave function is continuous <coughs> and the wave function uh, is derivative is continuous because what we say right there, this and this 
perspective here, even though the wave, the potential is not continuous the wave function is. Now, say a couple If V naught goes to infinity, then kappa goes to infinity, which means the wave function does not tunnel into the spin region. So if I have a potential that's a square well, and this goes up to infinity, then uh, we know that the solutions can't penetrate in. In fact, you can sketch solutions. They have to be eigenstates of parity. So they're cosine, sine, cosine, write down the solutions automatically because the solutions are eigenstates of parity. And they must alternate because the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are also eigenstates of parity. And because every wave function has one more node, we go from an even to a not to an even to a not. If this was a finite potential, again, the same thing would be true. So if I had a potential where this is now V0, and V0 is not infinity, well, now I can penetrate in a little bit, and I have solutions like that. And there's a finite number of bound states. Again, we can alternates them from even parity, odd parity, even parity. And know from the fact that they must go from even to odd to even, how this guy must be at e to the plus kappa x, and over here, e to the minus kappa x for the even guy. Whereas on the other side over here, we have the other kind of solution. This is e to the kappa x, and this is minus Okay? Because it has to be odd. So you should use parity when you have it. Now I want to conclude with one last thing about this. And again, I'm not going to go through these details. They're in the notes. You've solved these problems before many times. The part of the box, this kind of one way mechanics. We're not going to do it here. You have some homework to review those things. But I'm not going to go through that in detail. But I do want to say one last thing in our obligatory five minutes open course for the last thing. Suppose that I have a double well.
Well, it doesn't look so perfect, but it's supposed to be reflection symmetric. Okay. Reflection symmetric about this guy, right? So we know in this situation that the eigenstates are the eigenstates of parity. Okay. And they alternate from even to odd to even to odd. And the ground state has no nodes. So we could sketch that. The ground state solution. If it was a part of a it tunnels in. That's the ground state. Can I set just a little bit? What's that? Can I set this one? Yeah, we're going to quit in two minutes, but you can. Here, that's it. Uh, the first excited state has one node. And where is that node? It has to be. It has to be in the middle because it's anti-symmetric. So the first excited state, with some energy over here, looks quite similar. It looks like that. The next excited state will be at a much higher energy. Of course, it's got to be an even parity solution. And then the next one is an odd parity solution, which looks quite similar, but has the opposite power. So these solutions come in pairs of symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations of the particle localized in one or the other well. Okay. What ha would happen if that barrier between this went up to infinity? Would it all even? Well, they're not necessarily. They're both even and odd solutions. The particle can tunnel in from one side, but it can't. It can, tu it, can, it can tunnel into this, but it can't get into that region, right? This region is impenetrable. It's a hard wall. It's another word for infinite barrier. It's a hard wall, right? Which means that there, in that case, the particle really has those nodes there. It's a little bit different when we have those nodes. So there is a solution that looks like this. And it's a perfectly good solution. It satisfies all the boundary conditions. The wave function is just localized there. There's another solution. solutions are degenerate. They don't violate this theorem that we proved because we said something about the particle being able to extend to plus and minus infinity. When you have this case where it, you have an infinite barrier, you can have degeneracies. And this kind of solution, a solution which doesn't respect the symmetry of the Hamiltonian. Does it say psi is not an eigenstate of of parity, even though the Hamiltonian is an invariant, is known as a spontaneously symmetry broken state. The term spontaneous is irrelevant here. I can just call this a symmetry broken state. That's only allowed if I have degeneracies. If 
I don't have degeneracies, it's impossible. Because you have to have simultaneous eigenstates of the symmetry and the Hamiltonian. But when you have degeneracies, then I can take it. So what are the symmetry respecting eigenstates? Well, they're the symmetric and anisymmetric combination. So there is another solution, which is perfectly degenerate, which is this one. This solution is even. It's a linear combination of the two of you. There's another solution. That guy, he's degenerate. A degenerate solution. This is the anisymmetric combination. So as we said, when two operators commute, there always exist common eigenstates. But if there's degeneracy, you can, I can add these two, they all have the same energy, and it would be localized on this side. Or I can subtract these two, and it would be localized on that side. So final comment. Given this, and given this degeneracy, what can you tell me about the energy splitting between the symmetric and anisymmetric states for a finite barrier. Well, they have something to do with how much the particle can penetrate into the barrier between them. Because as I raise this barrier, these du this doublets will become closer and closer, eventually become degenerate. So there's something about the mixing of these two states that breaks the degeneracy. And that's an important problem that we'll study in more detail later in the notion of degenerate perturbation.